Amen. Welcome. Pastor Wayne Smith, Prosperity in Christ Church, San Antonio, Texas. Today we're going to teach on the garden blessing. Some people think that Jesus came to demonstrate the power of his divinity. They think that he came to, to show everybody uh, what he could do and the power that he had. But that's not why he came. He was already the word of God and he had nothing left to prove. After all, the word of God threw this very earth and universe into existence. I think that was enough proof of the word of God right there. So no, he didn't have to come to earth to become a man and prove what he could do. He could have done this from right up in heaven where his majesty shined. So he didn't come to demonstrate his power as God's son. He came to restore the power of the blessing, the original blessing from the garden before man fell, the power of the blessing. Everything in the garden before that fateful day was blessing. Everything was blessing. There was no curse. There was no sickness. There was no fear. There was nothing but blessing. Everything was blessed. So he didn't come to demonstrate his power as God's son. He came to restore the power of the garden blessing. Matter of fact, God's goal ever since the fall of man has to been restore the blessing of the Garden of Eden. It's been to restore what he first created. He came to teach and demonstrate the power of the blessing to us and for us. He came to restore our union with his Father. He came to restore the blessing. Jesus came to save us. He never performed miracles as a child, as some hidden books that have shown up claim. The Bible makes it very clear that he didn't perform a single miracle until after the Holy Ghost came upon him. During his baptism by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. If he was here to prove his divinity, he would have performed miracles as a child as well as after he received the Holy Ghost. But he did not because that is not what he came to do. He came to be a perfect example. Think about it. He was just as much a child of God then as he was later in his life, right? But he lived like we live and he did what we have to do. We have to receive the Holy Ghost. He had to receive the Holy Ghost. He didn't do anything that he didn't, that he didn't make an example for us to do. Amen. Amen. It wasn't until the moment he received the Holy Ghost that his ministry started that would teach us the blessing of the Lord. In Matthew 3, 16 through 17, it says, As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. This was the beginning of his ministry. Can you imagine what Satan must have thought when he heard God say those words? When he heard those words, the battle was on again for Satan. Can you imagine how Satan, when he heard God speaking out of heaven, talking about this is my son, how Satan must have just been in sheer terror and fear. Do you realize how many times Satan tried to kill the Holy One, tried to kill Jesus? Remember when he was a baby, he sent out and killed all the children, trying to kill the Holy One? And it goes way back further than that. It goes all the way back, back almost to the garden. When he killed Abel he, Abel, he didn't know if he was the Holy One, did he? He had no way of knowing. But he knew the Holy One was coming because God told him he was coming. Most people think Abel gave a better tithe than the Lord. A more worthy sacrifice 
because Abel was a herdsman or a livestock than his brother Cain. And Cain was a tiller of the earth. He was a grain farmer. Abel gave what he farmed and Cain gave what he farmed. It never was about what they gave. It was about how they gave. The word says that they both gave the fruits of their trade. The first of their trade. So there wasn't any lesser of quality in their offering by God's standards. It was the attitude of praise in the offering that God saw. Cain wasn't there to worship God in his offering like his brother Abel was. He was only there with duty in his offering. He was one of those, why should I have to tithe people? This is my money, people. That's what he was. His greed reached God. He was an angry tither. In Genesis 4, 6 through 7, it says this clearly. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, you will, you will be accepted. But if you do not what is right, <laughs> sin crouches at your door. So we see here the devil had no idea if Abel was the one. So he got into Cain and he killed Abel. This is a far reaching holy thing that was going on here. These men have fellowship with God. They talked with God. You understand that? They communed directly with God like we talk to each other. Most people think that the that after the Garden of Eden, God quit fellowshipping and talking with us. But this proves a whole other thing, doesn't it? The Bible says that God was talking to Cain himself. So what has happened isn't that God didn't want to fellowship with us anymore. That was never the case. That was never in the plan after the Garden of Eden because he was still fellowshipping with us. He talked to, to Cain like he was his son, didn't he? Like he would, you would talk to your own child or your, your brother or a friend, a dear friend or something. With advice, with love, with, with, with compassion, with a way, way to make it right. It was that we through sin separated ourselves more and more from him until we no longer fellowship with him at all. We could no longer even hear God. Satan started this when he had Cain kill Abel. The word of God says that in Genesis 4, 14 and 16. Today you are driving me from the land. I will be hidden from your presence. So Cain went out of the Lord's presence. There it is. Very clearly. Why is this important to know? Why do we need to know? Why is this so significant that we need to understand because if you don't understand this, you can't understand Jesus. Because it's Jesus who got us back into fellowship with the Father and made us able to stand in the Father's presence once again. It was Christ that reunited us with the Father in his presence and in fellowship. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus came to restore the ultimate blessing for us so that we could again stand before God as friends of God just like Abraham did. Amen. James 2.23 and the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. Biblical righteousness simply means in the right standing with God. Abraham was in the right standing with God. Abraham was a friend of God. We are in the righteousness of God. We are in the right standing of God, and we are friends of God. We are sons and daughters of God. We are God's children. The same way he went into Egypt, to, to, he said, he, these, these people are as a son to me. They're as a child to me. And I want my son back. And that's what he said. He went there and he got his son back, didn't he? He got them all, didn't he? He got his children. Well, that's us. 
Now listen to this. Red letter word from Jesus himself. This is what Jesus said. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to, made known to you. He calls us friends. Who was the last friend of God? Abraham? Talk about being blessed. Praise God. We're friends of God. We're not enemies of God any longer. We are friends with God. He is our friend. He is our father. He is dear to us. We are back. Now do you see why Satan killed Abel? Because until then we could still have a direct closeness with God. We were still talking to him one-on-one. -on -one. And we could still be taught God's way by God. But with God completely cut off from us, Satan could have his way with us, and he did. Before Jesus, he did have his way with us. There was a great dark period in there where God didn't communicate with man because he couldn't communicate with man. All Satan knew was he had to end this fellowship. So he did, and he did it with sin, and he did it with murder. This murder was a big, ugly, far-reaching thing. It was a monstrosity against God. This thing still reaches us today. If it wasn't for Jesus, we would all still fall under the guilt of this high treasonous crime. But thank the Father for his unending love and sending his son Jesus to deliver us from this ugly, horrible thing. Now when Satan heard those words of God talking from heaven again to a man, oh, what he must have thought. Can you imagine what he thought? I didn't get him. I'm in trouble now. When Jesus was baptized that day with John the Baptist, every nerve in his body must have cringed. Can you imagine what Satan was thinking? What am I going to do now? He is here. When he heard those words, he knew exactly who he was facing. He was the only one that knew he was the son of God. He knew. He knew then, beyond a doubt, that the baby born three decades earlier did live. And he had grown into the one with the power to destroy him and bring him down. And he brought him down. It wasn't but about a few years later that he went down there and took the power from him in the depths of hell. He took the keys from him and stripped him naked right there in front of everybody. Took all his power. Took the keys to death so that we could have life. And the devil didn't waste any time after he found out who Jesus was. Remember that he followed Jesus into the wilderness and, st and started tempting him in every way that he could think of almost immediately after his baptism from John. Remember the 40 days in the wilderness and he tempted him? But you know what happened? Jesus defeated him. How did he defeat him? He's with, it is written with the word of God. That's what Jesus defeated him with. The same word of God that we hold in our very hands that we have in our homes, that we have in our hearts and our minds. Jesus defeated him with the very words in the Bible you hold in your very hands. Talk about blessing. We have that word. We have it. It's not, it's not something that was kept from us. It's something we have. We have the word of God. We have the exact words he used. That's power. Talk about blessing. You hold the very written word of God that Jesus defeated Satan with in the wilderness. Think about that for a minute. And that's not all. Jesus gave us the authority to use his name and that word to have victory over all the works of the devil, just like he did. To have victory over all sickness, all diseases, all principalities, all the curses, all poverty, and all defeat. We have victory. 
We don't have to take it. We have the word of God to put against it. He used scripture against Satan and defeated Satan with scripture. We can defeat our curses and things that come against us with scripture just like he did because Jesus says we can. Jesus came to bring us the ultimate blessing. The authority to invoke his name, the written word of God, so we could have victory against this fallen, filthy, nasty, stinking Satan. Jesus went from the wilderness of temptation straight to the synagogue of Nazareth and made the announcement that turned the religious world upside down. Listen to what he said in Luke 4, 18 through 19. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom from the prisoners and for the recovery of the sight of the blind to set the oppressed free. That's us. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Let me repeat that. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And who gets this favor? We get this favor. All the religious world shuddered that day. Satan just lost his church. Satan was soon to be no longer in charge because there's a new king in town. His name is Jesus. Amen. Note verse 19, 7, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. What is the Lord's favor? It's the blessing of the Lord. That's the Lord's favor. It's what we receive, the blessing of the Lord. It's the love of God. It's daddy coming to save us. That's what it is. Amen. I want you to notice that Jesus didn't say that he was the son of God that day. He said only that he hath anointed me to preach the gospel. He knew that they were not ready for, for he was the son of God yet. But the people did understand what anointed meant and could relate with that a little bit better. After all, the prophets were anointed. Then some guy walking around saying, I'm the son of God. They had nutcases in those days too, okay? They weren't ready to hear that much truth. He knew they would think him nuts if he said that. But because he said he had anointed me to preach the gospel, it was a little easier for them to swallow and understand. He was telling them that the Holy Spirit had come on him and to undo what the devil had done in the Garden of Eden, the blessing of the Lord is back. That's what he told him. God had poured out on him the same power, the same mission as he did the first man, Adam, in the Garden of Eden. The power to create the same conditions of the garden wherever he went. There was no poverty, sickness, blindness, brokenness, or bondage in the Garden of Eden. Those came later from the curse that Satan brought us. Jesus was saying that he came to defeat the curse and bring the blessing back to man and woman, back to us, back into our lives, back into our house, back into our family, back into our church, back into our communities. So what he was really saying is, I've come back to restore the blessing of the garden. I've come back to restore the garden blessing, the original blessing of the Lord. I've come back to demonstrate and teach the blessing in the garden, and I'm anointed to do this. This is what anointing does. It removes the yoke of the enemy. It removes the burden of the curse. It destroys the very work of the enemy and brings to pass God's will on earth as it is in heaven. And God's will has always been the blessing for us. It fulfills Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not lack anything. 
Yea, though I walk through the valley of death, I will fear nothing because God is with me. With Jesus, the blessing worked perfectly because he kept the commandments perfectly. So the blessing moved through him without any issues, stopping the blessing through him. In time past, this was impossible. The blessing could come on people's lives, as with Abraham, Jacob, and etc. But it couldn't flow within them because they had sin in them. They weren't redeemed. They hadn't been born again. They were contaminated with sin because they hadn't been born again. But Jesus was different. His spirit was pure. And because of this, the blessing moved through him from inside out. He was the first man to have the Holy Ghost inside him. The first born again man was Christ. They just had the blessing on the outside. They couldn't receive the Holy Ghost because of sin on the inside. They hadn't been redeemed. And neither can we. We have to repent and receive Jesus so we can be born again. And once we are redeemed, free of sin, we can then receive the Holy Ghost. It cannot happen until then. Jesus was sin free already so he could receive the Holy Ghost. Do you see the difference? We could not before we were, if we're not born again, but Jesus was sin free. So he was already what we're trying to get to. Do you see that? What man needed to get to. So the blessing poured out of Jesus without any reserve whatsoever. So everywhere he went, he brought the Garden of Eden, the blessing with him. And how did he do it? Anybody that received him and believed on him and put their faith on him, the blessing he had would drive the curse out of their lives and they would be healed with that blessing. Sickness and demonic activity would flee out of their lives. The dead would rise. The only thing that could stop this blessing is the same thing that stops it for us, unbelief and lack of faith. Remember that the people of Nazareth found that out firsthand. Instead of receiving the blessing by faith, they said in Mark 6, 3 through 6, isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives, in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Most people think that these people denied Jesus because he said he was the Son of God. But Jesus didn't tell them that he was the Son of God. He said he was anointed because the Spirit of the Lord is on me. That's what he said. This is the message he preached wherever he went. In places where people accepted it. The blessing flowed like a mighty river during flood season into their lives. It overtook them and they were healed. And it still will today. Only believe. Jesus says only believe. People would follow him anywhere he went. They believed in the blessing. They believed in Jesus. But in places like Nazareth where people wouldn't believe, Jesus could do no mighty work, even though he wanted to do mighty work. Because of their unbelief. Let me tell you something very important. Unbelief closes the door on blessing. As a matter of fact, it doesn't just close the door on blessing, it slams the door on blessing. The people of Nazareth didn't just refuse to believe Jesus was anointed. They wanted to push him off a cliff. Remember, they wanted to kill him. Or should we say Satan used them to try to kill him once again? That's what happened. But it couldn't be done because Jesus walked in the blessing. He walked by faith in the blessing. As a result, they couldn't lay a finger on him. Think about this. This was in his own hometown amongst friends and family. 
So don't be shocked if your family and old friends shun you. Just walk right by them in the blessing when this happens, just like Jesus did. Just shake it off and say, well, that's fine. I'm in the blessing. You don't want it? I tried. See ya. I'll be here when you need me. The blessing on him blocked their sight and he just passed through the midst of them unnoticed and escaped. You know, there's during a few stories during World War II that, that people walked right through the midst of Nazis, right through just soldiers looking for them everywhere. They just walked right down the street, right past all of them, and they never even seen them. Why? Because God blinded them to the sight of his anointed. That's why. In addition to living in this power of the blessing, Jesus taught us how to live in the blessing. And it's the same today as he taught them. It's by our faith in Jesus, our faith in him. How did they receive healing? By their faith in Jesus. How do we receive healing? By our faith in Jesus. It's by faith that we receive the blessing. Jeremiah 17, 7 through 8 says, But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends its roots by the stream. It does not fear when the heat comes. It, its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought. It never fails to bear fruit. This economy that we're facing has no we we're, has no place in our lives. We serve a God that has lack of not any kind. We will not, we will not serve lack. We will serve Jesus. Amen. We will not lack anything. We will prosper when the rest of the country is falling apart. Why? Because our source is God. It is not of this earth. This is a biblical example of the believer in God. This is our godly life in action. Jesus said it best in Mark 5, 36. Do not fear, only believe. No matter what we see around us, no matter how our earthly economy looks, no matter what the doctor says, do not fear, only believe who handed you the, the one who handed you the blessing. We believe we live under the blessing and never under the curse. We will not accept defeat. We believe in Jesus. The Lord is my shepherd. I will not have lack of any kind. Thou preparest to feast in the presence of my enemy. Even if I walk through the valley of death, I will not fear because daddy walks with me. Amen. Hallelujah. That's the garden blessing. That's what the blessing is. That's the restoration of what Jesus came to give us. All we need to do is say, yes, I received the blessing. The garden blessing is that wherever the faith-filled speaking believer goes, the garden gets restored by them, by the blessing of the Lord. We are garden people. Amen? If anyone here doesn't know Jesus or just fallen away, please repeat these few powerful words after me. Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. I ask you into my heart. I make you my Lord and Savior. Amen. Hallelujah. Let us rise in prayer. Father God in heaven, we come to you in great gratitude for the message that you give us today, Father God. We thank you for the blessings of our life. We thank you for the restoration of our lives, Father God, because we know you are the restorer, Father God. Father God, we again pray for our children as they go back to school, Father God. And we thank you for them, Father God, our future, Father God. And we thank you for the, for everybody here, Father God. And we thank you for all things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. Thank you.